Welcome back, everyone, to our series on the intersection of technology and culture. Uh, we, we had a little bit of a sabbatical there. We're, we're delighted to be back up and running. We've got some uh, chats scheduled for the next several weeks, and we're eagerly booking uh, new talks for the rest of the summer. So we're, we're glad you're still with us. Um, if this is your first one, the, the basic point of the series is to really talk about and interrogate the ways technology and, and more specifically innovation is impacting many aspects of society. Uh, thus far, we've taken a pretty close look at um, the book and uh, music industries, talking both to artists and promoters and producers, promoters and producers, to get their take on the ways in which uh, technology really is shaping and, and, in some cases, disrupting kind of standard operating procedures. Um, and each time we have a conversation, we want to have an expert who can speak specifically to a certain sector. And today, I'm really thrilled. Uh, to talk about an area we haven't talked about yet, which is frankly kind of overdue, and that's the intersection of technology and innovation and education. So today I'm, I'm very happy to welcome Daryl Joyner, uh, who's going to be able to talk to us about work he's been doing for more than a decade. So Daryl, let me welcome you, and why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and, and where it brought you to where you are now, and uh, we'll kick it off from there. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join you. And uh, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I've taken kind of a interesting route to uh, the world of uh, educational technology or, you know, technology integration. Um, I uh, originally studied in college to go into radio, TV, or film, um, and uh, that was kind of short-lived. And then I, uh, after college, I spent about five years as a professional musician. Uh, tour toured all over the country doing that, and then uh, I uh, got interested in education in general. And I had already been always been kind of a technology person, you know, was interested in technology. And so the the marriage of the two at that time, this was probably just a little over 20 years ago. Uh, that that movement was just kind of beginning at that time, and so uh, from there. Um, that's where I started my career. So, like I said, I've been doing this for a little over 20 years. I've um, worked in uh, District of Columbia Public Schools. I spent uh, about three or four years working for Edison Schools, um, and they were headquartered in New York then. And I was um, managing the um, the educational technology teams on the East Coast for Edison Schools. Um, and I've also had two stints actually with. Uh, Arlington Public Schools. I was with Arlington for three years, went to work for Edison, and now I've been back with Arlington for just over 12 years. So that's kind of what, what got me to where I am right now. Okay. And, and for the benefit of the audience and myself, frankly, walk us through you know, what, what your title is and, and what that actually means. And, and I'm imagining um, certainly it, it's probably a lot different uh, job description in certain ways than it was 20 years ago. Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, so my actual job title now is Instructional Technology Coordinator, and I'm located at Abingdon Elementary School in Arlington. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that responsibility, I'm also the elementary lead Instructional Technology Coordinator. So um, there are a team of um, other people who do what I do at other elementary schools in the county, and I'm the, the lead ITC for that team. So that basically means I sit in on the leadership team, in our department, so I'm kind of the eyes and ears for our team um, at uh, at the table in terms of the direction we should go in, and in terms of communicating with uh, leadership to make sure that um, the voice of the ITC is at the uh, at the leadership table. So that's that's more you know defined as far as what I'm doing right now. Sure, and I think it's 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 particularly helpful to have someone like yourself. I, I would imagine. Some of these jobs are being filled by by uh, younger folks, and but for the purposes of this discussion, um, I, I find it interesting and, and and again very useful that you've seen kind of the best of both worlds in terms of you know the pre-digital world we live in now, the pre-internet world. How would you say you know right. broadly speaking, besides the obvious ways, once we plugged in and, and started living our lives and lesson plans online to a large extent, what are some of the major right. differences? you've noticed, you know, say from the early to mid 90s versus the way things are now. Well, 
<laughs> How long do you have, Sean? I was going to uh, say, for, for starters, then in three hours from now, we'll get to question two. So there was a time where there was this belief that all we had to do was put computers in classrooms and then the magic would just happen. We could just right. put kids in front of a computer and the computer would make all of our dreams come true. Mm -hmm. um, and, th and, and that's not hyperbole. I mean, that's really, that was really the prevailing belief that that, that would happen. And, you know, obviously you can, you can look back on it now and say, you know, that, there's nev that was never going to work. But, but that was the belief at the time. Um, and then over time, what you found was that um, people understood. And, and this is the, the major thing in terms of talking about technology in education is that everything has to start with the instruction. Everything. Um, the, how successful or uh, poorly something goes in terms of instructional technology is going to always come down to the design of the instruction or the, um, the expertise of the instructor. The uh, technology, and that's any sort of technology resource. Quite frankly, I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about computers, but that also includes things as rudimentary as a boombox or as a VCR or a DVD player, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, those things are just bit players. They're just there to support the design of the instruction. And so right. generally what I've seen occur since kind of the early days of um, instructional technology is more of an understanding that it's not instruction and then also this technology piece. It's all instruction. And so it comes down to understanding and leveraging what possibilities the use of technology bring into play. Because quite frankly, there are some things that you simply cannot do if you don't include some sort of technology resource or some sort of uh, technological resource. There's certain things that are just, you know, kind of uh, off the table. But it's understanding that, understanding those possibilities when you are designing the instruction to kind of make the two uh, dovetail. And, um, you know, so that's, that's really kind of what I've seen. And so now we're talking about things like uh, a lot of distance learning. Distance learning is a huge push right now. Um, and also uh, this is something that I've been working pretty um, – uh, heavily on in Arlington, and that's the idea of uh, having one device for every student. So um, all the things that you can do um, in terms of extending a child's learning, in terms of um, uh, uh, being more reactive to what children need, being able to di differentiate instruction to a much higher degree, all of those things. So I really think that that's kind of the that's the next big wave that we're going to see is. Um, actually having a device for every child and then designing the instruction in such a way where we can leverage all the possibilities that that gives us. And it sounds like what you're, what you're talking about is extending the teaching opportunities outside the classroom. Uh, where right. You're able to use these devices that are now, you know, so intrinsic to virtually everyone's life. Uh, the, the notion of how do we maximize the teaching potential during people's free time, because now I think what we've seen both in the professional world, and, and it's not a stretch for me to imagine, uh, now that we're talking about it, that that of course applies to education and, and students. The idea that there really isn't, the, the lines are increasingly blurred in terms of free time and what constitutes free time versus when you're using um, these tools, which of course everyone is now. Um, so I guess you're at once trying to utilize those tools right. and also competing with those tools at the same time. Right, and you know, it, it, and I think you bring up a great point. Um, and this is where we have to really be careful. Um, w what happens a lot of times in this discussion is that we'll start talking about instruction, or we'll talk about content, or outcomes, or even something like homework, for example. And then we try to take these new resources and then make them fit into kind of a, a more traditional construct of how we define those things. But what we're really talking about doing is we're really transforming what instruction looks like. We're transforming what content looks like. We're transforming what ma mastery looks like. We're transforming what homework looks like. What, what form does homework come in? So 
where we get into trouble, and one of the things that, that we really have to stress here as we move forward is let's think of new ways to conceptualize some of these things that have, you know, traditionally been in one form or the other, you know. So uh, that, along with the fact that we do want to extend the learning. Um, if you look nationwide right now, look at the data nationwide. There are achievement gaps from coast to coast. Mm -hmm. When you have an achievement gap, what you're in essence saying is there is a population of students who we're not reaching. For one reason or another, we're just not reaching them. I don't, and I don't know that there's a clear enough line to start pointing blame. It's not, it's not even about that. But it's, it's mm -hmm. very easy to see that we're not reaching certain students. Well, with this in mind, any opportunity where we can extend a child's learning beyond the classroom um, is an opportunity that we have to try to seize and we have on. And, and I would imagine there, there's so many inherent obstacles there. I would imagine budgetary concerns, both both internally in terms of the system, but budgetary concerns where we're, we're getting into, again, those blurred lines between certainly it, it seems like everyone has a PC now. Everyone has uh, some kind of tablet or smartphone. But the reality is, and, I, and, and it's certainly in certain pockets and sectors of our society, in a sector like Northern Virginia, it's probably pretty safe to assume a lot of these families have access to these, um, you know, technology capabilities, but that's not the case across the board. Right, and, and you know, it's so interesting. Much is, you um, how much of that is a right? We, it's um, it, I've had a unique experience in that for years in Arlington, um, I've been able to really focus on only my school, so. Uh, as far as I was concerned, kind of the realities of my school were basically my realities. Um, sure. Now that I'm working in more of a system level role, I'm starting to recognize that, I mean, even in a tiny little county like Arlington, it really runs the gamut um, as far as kind of where certain families are and, certain, and other families are. I mean, it's really such a huge um, disparity. So that's, I would say that that's it, it is a bit of a challenge when you're designing something like this, but I really see it more of as, as an opportunity. I mean, every challenge is really an opportunity in disguise. So uh, to me, what, what we try to do is we think, okay, uh, what are certain resources that we know we can't say with absolute certainty will be present in every home? And, and wireless and some sort of internet access is a biggie. Yeah. And even though uh, there are still public libraries and a lot of um, businesses and restaurants that offer free Wi-Fi, I don't think uh, it's not something that you want to make a habit of saying, well, we'll just go to the library. We'll just go to Starbucks. It's, right. it's not fair. So what we, one of our challenges is that when we're designing our system, we have to make sure that that content can, that there's a way, there's a procedure where we can follow where the content can live on the device where we aren't, uh, there isn't a necessity that there be wireless at home. Um, so we have to take all of those things into account as we're putting something together. And, you know, um, so traditionally in this realm, we've seen computers, computers, computers. So it's been lots of desktop computers, lots of laptops. Mm -hmm. And now that we're talking more about mobile devices, what you're seeing is school systems and just schools in general having. Um, uh, the majority of their machines be desktops and laptops with a small kind of contingent of mobile devices. Mm -hmm. I think what you're going to see as we progress through this and as the years pass, I think you're going to see that get turned upside down. And I think that the... Always be a place for those. But I think what you'll find is instead of having lots of those and a few mobile dev devices. I think if you look forward to even maybe three to five years from now, what you're going to see is lots of mobile devices and then a few laptops and desktops because there are certain functionality that you're going to still want from those. But what we're finding is that um, more and more, and this gets back to the same conversation regarding the instruction, what we're noticing is that as you begin to transform the instruction, transform the instruction, that creates a whole different set of functional needs in, in terms of saying 
this is what I need the resource to be able to do. These are the things I need to have happen for me when I'm delivering the instruction. What we're finding more and more is that mobile devices more than provide those functions. And so we're seeing that they can play a much greater role in the delivery of instruction and also a much greater role in terms of the students carrying out whatever needs to be carried out on the devices without necessarily having a full desktop or a full laptop. But those will still have their place. It's just I think you'll see that their, their role being diminished a bit. Sure, and I think that that's consistent with what we see here at at, the, at CEA and, and the, the research that my department does and looks at, the idea that mobile connected devices are becoming the new norm, have been the new norm for a while, right. and the upside of that, I think, as is typically the case with many technologies in the CE sector, that the devices tend to get smaller, better, and cheaper, uh, so right. it's kind of a win-win, uh, so, I, so I agree with that, and, and I love the the... I, I was thinking before you said it, the the key word being opportunity, um, right. in the sense that you know back in what what we could safely call the analog days, homework was a three ring binder and something you did with a pen or a pencil. Um, I, I love the idea and, and kind of the the challenges and opportunities associated with again this is a device that someone has with them. It's a ubiquitous device. I think in some regards it kind of demystifies the whole notion of homework and learning and it's almost uh, kind of a, a nice way of, of maybe for lack of a, a better word I facetiously would say tricking kids into realizing that they're they're learning even when they don't think they're learning and, and I think well, I would imagine that's the biggest opportunity and challenge. Right, right. Um, and it's it, it's one of those things where I feel we can't not seize this opportunity. The devices offer us so many new possibilities that we never even considered before. Um, like even in my case, at my school, I currently have teachers creating digital content for their students and delivering that digital content directly to their devices. So. If you think, for example, and I think if you if you talk to any teacher about this, and now now I don't want to I don't want to become like a textbook basher. I'm not trying to bash textbooks, but right. the truth of the matter is this: the moment the textbook is printed, it's on its way to being outdated. Sure. There's no indictment of textbooks. It's yep. just the reality. Yeah. Not only that, but we have students who learn in so many different ways. You know, you have kids who are, uh, who are great audio learners, who, kids who aren't so hot with text, uh, students who are more visual, all sorts of things. A textbook cannot speak to all of those different learning styles. And if you think about it, when, we t when I was talking about the achievement gap, that's part of us not reaching certain students. It's us not necessarily being able to deliver to a student material to them that speaks to their learning style. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying to my teachers now is, you know what? Make your own textbooks. And so they're currently making all their own quote-unquote textbooks. And they're including things like video, audio, web links, things of that nature. And what I'm noticing on all of them, they're very light on the text. Very light on the text. It does include just enough text that's necessary, but it's much heavier on the other modes of uh, content delivery. And we're seeing kids being so much more engaged than they ever were before. Right. And so these are little victories that we're trying to um, compile to kind of move this train forward. But um, you know, the things we've seen so far have just been fantastic. And so even in, if you go with the idea of homework, so we, I'm saying to my teachers, hey, let's reimagine what homework is. So what you're assigning. But not only are we reimagining reimagining that, we also have to reimagine what comes back to us. So what I'm seeing is I'm seeing teachers saying to their students, for homework tonight, I want you to share with me your understanding of this content, whatever the content may be. Mm -hmm. And then that's where it's left. It's not do this worksheet. It's not um, 
create a PowerPoint. No, it's saying to them, you choose the tool on your iPad that right. you think is the best way for you to convey what I want you to convey to me. So all of a sudden what you have is you have students who are saying, here's where I'm strong. You know, I happen to be very strong in this area, so this is the tool I'm going to use in conjunction with this is the thing that I think is the best way for me to convey this idea. Uh, even in math, um, and I've talked to math, math, math specialists in the county, and they say unanimously, the most important thing for them to see is the process. Yeah. So they're far less concerned about the final answer as they are about the process. Mm -hmm. And so we even have students taking their iPads home, and they're doing their homework via a screen recording. So you actually see them writing out the problem on the iPad as they talk their, talk their way through right. the uh, assignment. So what we find is, once that assignment is turned in, a teacher can easily see, that if, if the child got the wrong answer, the teacher, the teacher can easily see this is where they went wrong. At this exact point of the problem, this is where they went wrong. So when you're taking that sort of approach to it, now you don't have to give 40 math questions for homework. You could give five and say, and you know, and have them record their process throughout, and a teacher can get so much more information from that as opposed to trying to comb over a worksheet to determine where a student went wrong on a particular uh, question. So not only are we working smarter, we're working more efficiently, and then the, the data that we can get from that is much more powerful than it was before. Right. Well, that's so, that, that, that's so exciting to hear. And it seems to me such a kind of a no brain win win type of scenario, which is you're, you're always going to kind of retain the, the students who can learn the traditional model, you know, efficiently and effectively. But the idea of, of making someone actually excited about the process, I use the word right. demystify, but, you know, by, by kind of a cultural norm, we associate homework as a chore. Uh, something you know you you have to succeed at in order to get a certain grade. I see this as being a tool that's extremely useful for both teacher and student. Um, yeah. And and technology, it's a theme that resurfaces over and over again in these discussions and in the research that we do here. The idea of of taking potentially complex tasks and making them more efficient so that that more you know uh, less effort is expended to get greater results. And when you were talking, one, one example that I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, there's one in particular, but I'm sure this is happening everywhere. Uh, someone was telling me a story recently about like an uncle who was a mathematician or, or something or just good at math and his grandson or nephew or whatever was having trouble with math, lived in a different state, and the, uh, right. the guy started recording to YouTube the math equations or whatever, the math lesson, and the kid was learning right. from that. But since it was on YouTube, it caught fire because a lot of other kids were noticing, hey, this guy's great. To me, that extends right. to when I have I, I have another friend who recently got a smoker, and instead of going to Google and saying, well, what are some instructions, he went right to YouTube, and of course, there's videos of people that are, are you know obsessed with smoking pork showing how to do it. So I, I think that speaks to a couple of things. Obviously, it talks about technology. And, and the amazing power that has. But I really, I think it speaks to what you were talking about, both for kids and adults. Some of us do like to learn visually and, and things that might seem, you know, like an Ikea instruction, something that just seems completely inaccessible is suddenly extremely accessible and it has a very human form. And, and one That's of right. the kind of an inherent potential dichotomies I love in that is, is the naysayers, and I think the more traditional thinkers, are, are constantly harping on how technology depersonalizes us and, and prevents connections from occurring. And I think the reality is, in so many instances, it does the exact opposite. It's, it's an exact opportunity, opposite. like what we're doing right now. We're able to have a real-time conversation that actually we are recording that we can save and use for future purposes, but it, it's enhancing and, and facilitating a real human interaction. Absolutely. It, it is, I couldn't agree more that is the exact opposite. And I think we, we forget sometimes as adults, adults who are comfortable with technology, we forget. So think about it this way. Let's say that you were interested in nuclear fission, the fusion or whatever. You know, right. Let's say whatever it may be, you, you decided, hey, I'm curious about this. You just go to Google or you just go to YouTube or you go 
anyway, you, you decide, uh, I'm just going to find this out. We are in a culture now where not knowing something or having zero understanding of it, it's really going away. That concept that that I'm just going to, I'm not going to understand something, and then I'm just going to go, oh, well, I don't understand it, and then leave it at that. That almost never, ever happens. Right. There's always that initial step of saying, I'm going to find out something about this. I'm going to at least gain a base level of knowledge about this. Mm -hmm. Well, we have walking among us <laughs> these tiny little sponges who think the same way. Yeah. So it's essential that we we leverage these possibilities to allow them to do a lot of the same things. A lot of the things we do to seek knowledge, they want to do the exact same thing. Sure. And so we, once again, you know, all about opportunity. It's all about that opportunity for students to uh, extend their learning and go beyond. Go beyond, like, uh, oftentimes we talk about uh, that spark. A teacher lights that spark in a student. Well, that spark is supposed to turn into a flame. It's not supposed to just stay a spark. Right. Well, we can't also be responsible for every element of it becoming a flame. At some point, that student wants to take that, that bit of information that we've shared with them. They want to run with it. And we have to make sure that we've facilitated that. And, um, you know, you mentioned the naysayers. <laughs> I get to talk to naysayers quite often. And um, what I find oftentimes is that um, the, the opinions are generally misinformed. Right. A lot of what I'm saying to people, it's it's like the first time they even considered it. Um, and and the, uh, oddly enough, it's on both sides of this discussion. So um, I will hear people say, um, you know, in particular in in the case where the, where I'm working on now, uh, and that being a second grade iPad. So one to one iPads for second grade is I'll, I'll hear people say you know, second graders, they don't need iPads, there's no need for that, and it's a waste of money and all of these things. Right. Then I start detailing <laughs> all the things that it's going to make possible. And I say, oh, okay, would you like your students to have greater access to reading material? Well, of course I would. Oh, okay. Um, would you like your teachers to be able to offer flipped instruction to your kids so that they can get a head start on what's going to be taught tomorrow? then that way the teacher can better differentiate their lessons and uh, be more precise in their instruction and their instructional planning. Oh yeah, of course I want that. And you know, would you want your teacher to have more formative data to help uh, inform his or her planning? Yes, we have to have that. Well, right. <laughs> and so this thing will make all those things possible. Um, right. And it's one of those things where um, there's a cost to everything. So they spend a lot of time thinking about if we go in this direction then this is the the uh, catastrophic event that will take place right. but what I will say is if we don't go in this direction and then we deny all those possibilities I see that as equally if not greater a greater catastrophe sure but we have to remember that there's costs on both sides but even those who kinda of support this this sort of movement I hear this often as well where they'll say well uh, students have to use computers and iPads because when they go out into the world of work, they're going to have to know how to use a computer. Mm -hmm. And I will tell them, if at the end of this we've created a generation of students who are great at using iPads, then we have failed that generation of students. Okay, um, even that world that they that they're talking about that that world of work where you use a computer, mm -hmm. that that construct is so one-dimensional to me where I will say to them that is not the world that we need to prepare kids for that's right I am saying let's talk about a world that's filled with problems that need to be solved mm -hmm. let's talk about a world where if you are capable of abstract thought you automatically have an advantage if you are able to leverage the understanding of, of um, of a cause and effect. If you're able to really take cause and effect and apply it, that's what I want to prepare our kids for. It just so happens that part of transforming the instruction 
and transforming that instructional environment and the role that technology can play, it makes it possible for us to really start to churn out some great thinkers, some real uh, higher order thinking skills from students and that's what I want us, want us to be able to bring out uh, in terms of this movement, in terms of this transformation of instruction. You, I mean, you just articulated, as most of our guests inevitably do, kind of a real, a working kind of application of, of how this intersection that we talk about really works and how it impacts lives. And, and I think you're talking in a lot of regards about upfront investment on things that are going to pay off. And, and I think what you're alluding to, which excites me, um, the, the, the idea that it's an upfront investment in terms of dollars and time, but it's not just for the instruction. These are life skills that typically aren't learned until later in life. So we really are theoretically equipping younger students with skills that they will be needing to use, which is a benefit to them, to society, to the job force. It, it, it touches on all those things. Um, I think the, the other thing we talk about the way technology intersects I think the key word that, that often is thrown around is disruption. And what you're talking about really is a disruption to older models. Um, and there's always going to be resistance to that. Right. We, un unbelievable. I'll, I'll let you have the final word. We're, we're just about out of time. But I, I, I want to invite you back right now because there's a couple of questions I didn't even get to. Maybe talking oh, yes. about some, some of the, you know, some of the applications, some of the ways you've seen behavior change. Um, so let's, let, let's say that round two, as soon as possible, if you're up for it, Absolutely. But, um, so that's great. And I'll let you have the closing word. I mean, as far as, you know, what's your, say, we'll talk more soon, but what, you know, your general attitude in terms of where we are today and, and you know, your relative optimism in terms of where we're headed. Right. Um, so I would say where we are today is um, <laughs> there are, um, the tipping point is getting close, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and in terms of all of this thinking being disruptive, I think it is disruptive. Um, but I think we have to get out of the thinking that, um, and this is, I think, kind of where we have been in this whole process, where we'd say uh, instructional technology is where we try to incorporate technology into core curriculum. The problem with that philosophy is that it's treating curriculum as a stationary thing. Core curriculum is just this thing that's not changing, and it's monolithic, and it's just that. And now I have to find a way to shoehorn technology into it. Right. But what we're now starting to realize is, no, curriculum and instruction cannot be this monolithic entity. What we have to say is, how can we transform how instruction is being delivered and what all of these traditional methods look like? How can we reinvent that? to take advantage of all of the new possibilities of the world in which we live to then better fold in technology. So I think that's where we are moving forward. It's us beginning the process of transforming instruction to leverage all of the new possibilities that we didn't have before. So I'm really optimistic and excited. It's hard work for sure. It's complicated work, but I think it's worthwhile. That's fantastic. Daryl, I, 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 I... I appreciate your time, and it, it gives me a lot of confidence and, and inspiration to think that you're doing the work you're doing. Because, again, I mean, it really, it, it, it's an investment on young lives, which is certainly validates any effort put in, but it, it really is improving the culture and society. So it's difficult to make a counterargument against any of these things. And, uh, again, I, I'd like to have you on again soon so we can – there's a lot of meat on this bone. So I look forward to talking more, and I, and I think our audience – will really appreciate, uh, you know, some of the things you have to say. Great, great. Anytime. It's been a real pleasure. All right, likewise. So we'll talk to you soon. Okay, that's great, Sean. Take care. All right, thanks, Daryl. Right.